I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua 24. If you don't have uh, a Bible with you, that is okay. Uh, We've got Bibles in the pews that uh, look amazingly like this one that I'm holding right here. And it looks like this. And if you uh, just grab one of those, turn to page 252, you will find Joshua 24 right there. Uh, Just a heads up, we're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture. They're listed in your notes. So if you want to get a a mark and and get those passages marked out ahead of time, that's great. And by the way, if you need a Bible... You want to read the Word of God, you don't have a Bible that you, that you own, take one of these, please. They are our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, let it change your life. Uh, who are you at the very core of your being? When you strip away all the titles, all the positions, all the roles that we play, what's left? When it's just you and God... Who are you? Uh, This morning we're continuing our series called The Core, and today I want to talk about our DNA as a church, and and what I hope is your DNA as a follower of Jesus. Uh, We're not going to deal with core values or essential doctrines today, but who are we when everything is stripped away? Because I submit to you that what we are when everything is stripped away is we are servants of Christ. It's our identity at the very core of our being. Uh, In Joshua chapter 24, here's the setting. The people of God were in the promised land. They, uh, remember the story is this. They were in Egypt in slavery. Moses led them out of Egypt, out of slavery. They came to the edge of the promised land. They rebelled against God. And so God had them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the faithless generation was gone. Even Moses died in the wilderness, and Joshua took over, and he led the people of God into the promised land, and they conquered the promised land. So he was there now. They've, they've settled in the promised land. They're in their place, and he comes to the end of his life, and he challenges the people of God with these words. Joshua 24, beginning in verse 14, he says, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Joshua says, choose whom you will serve. Notice he doesn't say decide what church you're going to go to or decide what cause you're going to contribute towards. He says choose which God you are going to serve. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I believe you've already made that choice. Because uh, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you've already decided which God you're going to serve, and you are servants of Christ. It is at the core of our identity. Think about this. Um, You know, Scripture says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So if you confess Jesus as Lord, what does that mean? It means that you're saying, Jesus, you're my master. You're my king. You're my authority in life. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. So let me ask you this. If Jesus is our master, then what are we? Servants. We are servants of Christ. And and so I want to ask you a question that kind of frames everything else that we're talking about. And really, I kind of hope haunts you throughout the week. And it's this, if you're a servant of Christ, are you living as a faithful servant? Are you living as a faithful servant? See, we are servants of Christ, and as servants, we serve because Jesus served. You know, if we understand our identity as servants of Christ, then this is our motive. We serve because Jesus served. Um, 
if you really want to live as servants of Christ, then you have to understand the why. At least I believe that you really need to know the why if you're going to take hold of the motive and, and it's going to be part of the core identity that we have. And, and I was one of those kids growing up that when I asked my parents something and they said, because I said so, I hated it. Anybody else with me on that? Just hated it. Parents, don't use that. That is so lazy. Give them a reason. You know, because as a kid, I was just like, okay, one day I'm going to overthrow this regime because that's not a good enough answer. <laughs> right? And, and I know there's people in this world who do stuff because somebody said so. But the truth is, when it gets difficult, they abandon that. It's not a life-changing motive. We need to know the why. And, and, and I can tell you we serve because Jesus served, but let me explain that. Let me give you two reasons why we serve because Jesus served. First of all, because Jesus set the example. The example of Jesus. Uh, John chapter 13, the Gospel of John. If you're using a Bible like mine, it's page 1145. Um, that's the easy way to get there. John 13, uh, again, let me give you the setting. This is the Last Supper of Jesus. You know, this is the night that he's betrayed. This is the day before, the night before he's crucified. So he's coming to the end of things. And he gets his disciples together to celebrate the Passover. And, and while he's there, of course, he institutes the Lord's Supper, what we call communion. Reminds us that, uh, uh, of his death and resurrection. But John records that he does something else in addition to that. That he gets up from where he's seated and he, and he puts on the servant's garments. And, and he gets down on his hands and knees and he washes his disciples' feet. He serves them. Knowing that he's going to die in a few hours, knowing that, that they're all going to abandon him, one of them's going to betray him, and he washes their feet. And, and, and at the end of that, the pick up in verse 12, where he begins to talk to them after this event. It says, When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus said, I have set an example for you. I gave you an example. This is how I want you to be as my followers. So Jesus demonstrated humility and acted as a servant and said, I want you to do this. Now, there are actually some groups, Christians, who take Jesus literally and I want you to do this, and they do foot washing as part of their church service. There's actually a group called Foot Washing Baptists. Believe it or not. Hey, every family's got crazy aunts and uncles. They're in the family, <laughs> but they do this. Obviously, those churches are pretty small. I, I kind of imagine they're mostly filled with people with foot fetishes, but, you know, that's just kind of me. But anyway, I don't think that's what Jesus meant. I don't think he literally wanted us when we get together to wash each other's feet. I think what he wanted us literally to do was be servants. To understand that we are to care for one another, that we are to value each other, that we are to serve each other with our lives. That that's the example he was setting. Now, there's a, a, an amazing subplot in this story. Uh, if, I hope you'll go home and read the whole story in John 13. But Jesus is going around washing the feet of the disciples. And he comes to Peter. And Peter is like, you're not going to wash my feet, Jesus. I get this. I'm the servant. I should wash your feet. You can't wash mine. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. You have no part of me. Now, of course, Peter relents and he lets Jesus wash his feet. Uh, but, uh, but here's the thing. Sometimes our pride tells us that we don't need what Jesus offers. And we kind of say, Jesus, that's okay, I'll handle this, I'll do it on my own. And, and, and I don't want you to be mistaken. If you're trying to earn your salvation, if you're trying to be good enough, do good deeds, uh, uh, then you have no part of Jesus. You, you see, Jesus served us. On the cross, he washed the disciples' feet and said, Look, I'm serving you. But then he went to the cross and he washed our sins away with his blood. 
That's what he was doing. He paid a debt that you and I cannot pay ourselves. We need Jesus to serve us if we're going to have any hope. And, but here's the thing. We have to receive that gift that he's offering us to serve us, to wash our feet, to pay for our sins. And if you haven't received that gift, you have no part of him. And, and Jesus is offering to serve you. Ha, have you allowed him to serve you? And if so, then are you serving Jesus because he set the example for us? He said, this is what we do. This is what my family does for one another and for the world. So we serve because Jesus set the example. And secondly, we serve because it is the path to greatness. It is the path to greatness. I want you to turn back over a couple Gospels back to Matthew chapter 20, page 1049, if you got a pew Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 20. Again, uh, there's just a great backstory here. Uh, Two of the disciples, James and John, wanted to ask Jesus a favor. They were kind of chicken, so they brought their mama with them. And, uh, and they let their mama do the talking. And she said, Jesus, can my boys be your number one and number two in your kingdom? Can, can you, they sit at your right and left hand. And Jesus kind of rebuked her and said, you know, that's not for me to decide. The Father's already decided who's going to get those seats. And uh, so, you know, I can't promise you anything. Well, the other disciples heard about this, and they got mad, right? They were jealous. Hey, I want to be in that seat, not you. And, and so they're arguing amongst themselves about who's the greatest. And so Jesus gets them all together, and he kind of tells them this. Matthew 20, beginning in verse 25. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wow. So let me ask you this. Who in here wants to be successful in life? Yeah, most of the hands go up. I still can't figure out why everybody doesn't raise their hands. So let me just turn the question around. So who wants to be a failure? <laughs> See, nobody ever, you know, raises their hand, you know, on that. You know, I was like, hey, I want to be a failure. I want to set really low expectations so I can reach them. Uh, it's really easy to meet that goal. No, we, we desire to be successful in life. And it doesn't matter how you define success. I mean, maybe success for you is a great family. You want to have a happy marriage. You want to have great kids that, you know, care about you enough that when they grow up and move out, they come home to visit sometimes. You know, maybe you want to have, you know, a great job or build a great business. Or maybe you want to have houses and cars and toys. Or maybe you just want to be, you know, rich and famous. I don't know. However you define success, here is what I know. The path to success lies through serving. The path to greatness or success lies through serving. That's what Jesus said. And, and let me just acknowledge, this is a huge stumbling block for most of us. It, it really is. It, it gets in the way of us being followers of Christ. Because we see Jesus' example and we go, amen. Look what Jesus did. That was awesome. And we hear Jesus' words, and we nod our heads and go, yep, that's what we should do. And then we walk out these doors, and we try to be successful on our own terms. We try to be successful our way, knowing that Jesus said, if you want to be a success, you got to be a servant. And we kind of tip our hats to Jesus, and we try to do some good deeds. We do go participate in a service project. We do some random acts of kindness. We pay it forward, buy somebody coffee behind us, and we feel good for a little bit. But we don't embrace being a servant as our core identity. See, this is where following Jesus confronts our common sense and our conventional wisdom, right? Because the world defines greatness differently than Jesus. The world defines success differently because great people, successful people, have servants, right? It's not politically correct to call them that anymore. So they have assistants and they have employees and they have people who do stuff for them, right? 
And, and we all think that we want to be those people, so we go on cruises so we can pretend for a week that we're one of those people. Right? Because we, we're going to get weighted on hand and foot. Anybody else like me, the last night of a cruise, you're kind of like in depression because you have to go back to real life? <laughs> you know? It's like, I have to give up all this. And, and that's how the world defines success. And Jesus said, no. That's not how we do it. My way is different than that. And by the way, Jesus' way works better than our way. Always. So if you really want a successful marriage, you need to serve your spouse. Husbands, you need to serve your wives. Wives, you need to serve your husbands. See, that, that's opposite how we normally do it because we're selfish. We kind of go, hey, uh, we're, we're, I want us to be happier. You need to change. <laughs> you need to meet my needs. My needs are not being met. And you need to do, change your life so that my needs are met so I'll be happier. No, that's not how it's going to work. If you really want a better marriage, then decide that you're going to serve your spouse. You're going to focus on meeting their needs. You want great kids? Then you need to serve your kids. You go, what does that look like? Just give them whatever they want? No. No, not at all. Serving your kids means that you in- encourage them and you discipline them and you invest time in them and you teach God's values to them on purpose. You want a great business or a great job? then serve your employer or your customers or your employees. You know, stop griping about your job or vying for promotions and instead care about your coworkers and help them to succeed and bless the people around you. You want a successful life? Here it is. Focus your life on blessing people in Jesus' name. Not as something occasionally that you do as an afterthought, but as the focal point of how you live. And I know some of you right now are protesting in your minds because you're saying, but if I do that, if I really approach life that way, people will take advantage of me. Kind of like they did Jesus. But if I remember right, Jesus said something like this. If you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and come after me. By the way, did Jesus win? In the end, when it was all said and done, did Jesus win? Right. See, he set the example for us and said, hey, do it this way. Live this way. Serve this way. And in the end, you will win. Because now Jesus, who suffered and died on the cross, where it looked like people were abusing him and, and destroying him, were actually following the, God's eternal plan. And, and Jesus now has the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And, and most of us in this room have already decided to do that. But others will do it because they realize too late who he is. So here's what happens when we decide that we're going to serve as the path to greatness. God is the one who defends us. God is the one who heals us. God is the one who promotes us. God is the one who exalts us. You know, Scripture actually says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may exalt you in due time. If we serve, God takes it on as his responsibility to lift us up. So let's just be real blunt about it. Honestly, who would you rather trust for a promotion, God or your idiot boss? I'm just asking my staff that question, okay? Hey, truthfully, do you really think continuing in selfishness is going to heal your marriage or help your kids? You see, serving just means that we look after others as if they were just as important as us. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 put it this way, Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind consider others more important than yourself. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. So if you really want to be successful, serve. Serve. So our identity, we are servants of Christ. Our motive, we serve because Jesus served. He set the example, and it is the path to greatness. And finally, 
We serve to influence our community for Christ. This is our strategy. Uh, a few years ago, I was introduced to a book called Unchristian. Kind of a crazy name for a book, isn't it? Especially a Christian book. What some guys did is they did a bunch of research and they interviewed thousands of people who don't go to church at all. No church affiliation. And, uh, and he asked them all kinds of questions, but the, the one that stuck with me was this. He asked them, when you think of Christians, what words come to your mind and how would you describe them? Here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try to figure out what their top two responses were. But don't tell me. I want you to tell the person sitting next to you. Okay? Top two responses. Ready, set, go. Okay, understand you're going to be graded on your answers. So think about this. Okay, got your answers? I'm not giving you a lot of time. Okay, trade papers, because if you grade your own, you'll cheat. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here's what they, here's what they thought. The, the top two responses unchurched people gave when asked what they thought of Christians. Number one, Christians are hypocrites. hypocrites. You guys all got that one right. Number two, what do you think? Judgmental. 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 Not exactly what we were aiming for, is it? So, so here's the reality. We have this mission to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. How are we going to lead people to Jesus when they just think that we're a bunch of judgmental hypocrites? That's the dilemma that we're facing. Here's the answer. We're going to serve them. We're going to serve them. Uh, serving is the antidote to hypocrisy. Think about it. it. You know, it's putting your life where your mouth is. It's living what we say that we believe. It's following Jesus' example. Uh, serving means that we live and act differently than they expect. It surprises people. Right? Because like, that's, you, you guys weren't what we expected. I, I bet some of you came here for the first time when a friend invited you to Calvary, and you're like, this is not what I was expecting from church. <laughs> See, it's, it, it's a surprise. And, and uh, in, in fact, it, it happened again uh, you know, down on Main Street this year. And by the way, there, we had like 200 volunteers last weekend that were serving here at Halloween Jam and down on Main Street. Thank you. You guys did an awesome job. Yeah. But... But here's the crazy thing, and it happens year after year after year down on Main Street on Friday night, is people come through and they play games with, the, you know, with uh, the Calvary people and all the game booths we have set up. We give them tons of candy, and, and people are going, why are you guys doing this? Because uh, everybody else is selling us something or trying to promote their business, and you guys are just down here loving on my kids and, and giving us candy, and um, you're supposed to be judgmental hypocrites. Do you see how that confronts some of the, the perceptions in people's minds? And, and so uh, we just smile and invite them to church and go, it'll be different than you expect too. See, it's, it's, it, it surprises people. And then serving eventually leads to us earning the right to be heard. Earning the right to be heard. At some point along the way, as we're serving people, they will invite us to speak truth into their lives. That, that's the process. That's what we do. We're going to serve. By the way, that's why we serve our community. That's why today we're launching a brand new ministry at Calvary called Serve. I know, it's so creative, isn't it? Came up with that myself. <laughs> serve, because we want to help all the servants of Christ find a way to bless other people in Jesus' name. Because we expect an influx of new people when we occupy Sweetwater and our new worship center. And we need help serving the people that are going to come. Because we want to expand our influence in Lake Havasu through serving in our community organizations and schools. And serve is going to help us accomplish this. This is our strategy. Now, if you've been a part of Calvary any length of time at all, you know that we're already a church that serves. 
for about 10, 12 years, we have intentionally been serving our community. You know, uh, Main Street is just part of that, partnering with interagency, uh, with uh, all kinds of groups in town. We, we you know, do car shows. We uh, bless the schools, all that kind of stuff. And, and it's earned us a lot of respect in the community. That's awesome. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> I just confess to you that we've been doing that for 10 years without any organization or structure whatsoever. It's just all organic. We're kind of like, hey, that's a great idea. Let's go over here and do this. Hey, you guys want to come help us do that? Okay, and you guys just show up. It's awesome. But, but here's the reality. There's more and more of us all the time, and we want to have a greater impact, and we need to organize and, and create a ministry that allows us to unleash the power of our volunteers here at Calvary to make a difference, a life-changing difference in Lake Havasu City. And so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and, and here's just kind of a little bit of the vision that I see, what kind of God's showing me uh, a little bit. Let me share that with you, see if it doesn't resonate. Uh, I've mentioned before that we have about 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. About 40,000 people who need to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus, who need hope for their marriages, reconciliation for their families, who need to be set free from their addictions, who, who need God's power in their life. They're, they're your friends and your neighbors. How are we going to reach 40,000 people? Okay, step one, we've talked about this. When we occupy Sweetwater, the new worship center, in the first six months we're there, we want to have 4,000 guests. 4,000 guests. How are we going to have 4,000 guests? Well, we're going to advertise like crazy, and we're counting on you guys to each bring three friends that don't go to church. Three friends. Three unchurched friends. That's all we're asking you to invite. You can invite more. That's all right. Uh, but here's the thing. We want you to start working on that now. Start writing down names now. Start praying for them now. Because the truth is, the first three people you invite probably won't say yes. Not all of them. You're going to have to invite more. And so you need a list longer than three names, I hope. Uh, so that's step number one. 4,000. What, what happens after that? How are we going to reach the, the next 36,000 people to touch them with the gospel of Jesus Christ? I believe serve is a major component of that. Because here's what, here's what I want to see happen. Uh, I want to see us partner with organizations in the community. Organizations like Pregnancy Care and Haven House and Hospice and Interagency. And, and just send volunteers to go and serve our community through those great organizations. And while you're there, represent Jesus Christ in Calvary. Because you're going to be rubbing elbows with people who don't go to church and who don't know any Christians and who don't want to, they think, because we're a bunch of judgmental hypocrites. And you get approved to them differently and influence. And at some point along the way, you'll have an opportunity to invite them to come with you. I, I want to see us have a presence, not just once or twice a year, but every single week in every school in our community. I want to send them volunteers that can read to kids and, and tutor kids and help teachers any way they need so that we're present there investing our lives in making our education better and being an influence for Christ in this community. I, I want to see us send out volunteers into our community in ministries that none of us have even imagined yet that, that will transform our community and unleash the power of God to change like Havasu City. That happens when we embrace this identity of being servants of Christ and live it out day in and day out, whether we do it in formal ways or in your day-to-day -day life. So I ask you, how will you serve? How will you serve? Uh, I'm going to ask you to, two things this morning, two specific actions to take uh, for everyone who's part of Calvary. If you're a guest uh, you can do this if you want to, but I'm not asking you to do it. If you're part of Calvary, the first thing is I'm going to ask you to fill out one of these serve volunteer information cards. I told you we've been doing all these events and stuff with no organization, and we want to create a database that tells us who we have in our congregation that, that wants to serve and how they want to serve so that we can plug you into needs that we have uh, on a regular basis. Because we're going to develop the community relationships, and we're going to ask them for needs, and we're going to share those with you so that you can plug in and make a difference. So whether you want to serve one hour a year or ten hours a week, fill this card out, drop it in the offering box, take it to the serve table, drop it by the church office, just get it back to us. If you don't remember how to use paper and pen because you are completely digital, great. The serve team... Serve team has a web, you go to our website, calvarylhc.com, and fill it out online. 
They would love that because that way they don't have to take your paper and put it online. You can do it for us. So either way, fill it out. Do that for us because we want to be able to uh, help you plug into serving at Calvary and in our community. Request number two, stop by the ministry tables on your way out. We're having a party out front. You guys probably saw that on your way in. There's candy, there's cookies, there's treats, there's popcorn, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and here's what you're going to find on the tables. Opportunities to serve. Opportunities for you to use your gifts, your abilities, your talents uh, to help bless the church. Now, most of these opportunities are church-related. They're helping us get ready for the next wave of people. They're, they're needs we have, but maybe you didn't know that we had. So stop by, check those out, see what God leads you to do. Now, we're going to develop some community uh, pieces of that. In fact, uh, one of them came to us this week. So if you want to, you're like, I want to serve in the community and I want to do something this week, then we have an opportunity for you. Interagency needs some people to do two things, to drive around and pick up donated food and bring it back to the food bank. And secondly, they need people to help sort the food at the food bank and, and make the holiday baskets. If you're interested in doing that this week or next, then stop by the serve table and they will tell you how you can connect to them. See Amber or Natalie, they're the serve coordinators. Now, the, uh, the other thing I want to tell you about, uh, it's just something that you can focus on and do, is we're offering a brand new class called Equip. Some of you are sitting here going, but I don't know how I can serve God. I really don't understand my gifts and my ability. I, I just don't know how to do it. We have a class for you. And if you want to learn more about serving and who you are and how God made you and how you can plug into his kingdom, then, uh, wait, there, there, were, there was supposed to be a slide up there. Maybe not. Uh, I don't know. It was the advertisement slide. Well, we've got a couple of classes coming up in the next couple of weeks. It's there now. Oh, look, it showed up. And... and uh, and, and again, you can sign up online, you can sign up at the serve table, because we want to help you be the servant that God created you to be. See, folks, we are servants of Christ. The question is, are we going to be faithful servants of Christ? My commitment as your pastor is I'm going to do everything I can to help you be faithful. But the reality is this. You have to make the choice to be that faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, thank you for serving us by sending Jesus to be our Savior. And Lord, we confess that a lot of times we're, we're selfish. We don't want to serve. We're lazy. We're too busy doing our thing for our stuff and our agendas. And today we simply want to repent and we invite your spirit to fill this place and to fill our lives and to change us, to teach us how to really be servants of the living God. So God, burn that identity on our souls and let us leave this place ready to transform our world in the name of our Savior. Because it's in his name that we ask this. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship our God this morning.